been following the last hours of Jesus. And we started in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then we looked at his arrest, and there's still a ways to go. Uh, today, what I want to look with you at is uh, Jesus is taken after he's arrested, and he's taken, first of all, he appears before the high priest, the retired high priest, Annas, and then he appears before Caiaphas. And then you have the sequence with Peter and the uh, denial of his Lord, and I believe, I was going to put that all in here, but that's going to be another time, that'll be next time. So anyway, today I just want to look at those two pieces with you. I'm going to invite you, I'll tell you the scriptures, these are in all four Gospels, Matthew 26, 57 to 75, and Mark 14, verse 51 to 72, Luke 22, verse 54 to 65, and John 18, 12 to 27, those are, the, those are all the sections, and part of that we'll do next week with uh, Peter's denial, and how that relates to the last hours of Jesus. First of all, they take Jesus to Annas. Annas had been the head. He was the head of the priestly family. He had been the high priest. Now he's advanced in age, and he is determined to take down Jesus, and he's not, not sure that Caiaphas has what it takes. Caiaphas is the current high priest, and they're kind of cunning and wily sorts, but Annas is not so sure about Caiaphas, so he is going to have Jesus brought to him first. So they take Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane, and he goes first to Annas. And if you look at John 18, that probably tells us the most about this part of what happens. So we're going to look at John 18 to begin with here. And we're looking at verses 19 to 23. Jesus is brought in. Annas begins asking Jesus questions. He asks about his disciples. He asks about Jesus' teaching. Jesus' response is that, well, I've taught openly. I've even taught in the temple. Where were you when I was teaching in the temple? He says he's taught nothing in secret. And in fact, Jesus tells the high priest, Annas, the, the most respected, I guess, man in Israel at that time, he tells him, go find some witnesses and you ask them what I taught. Someone might think here that Jesus was violating Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, remember we're told there to obey the authorities. But I want you to remember what's going on here. They are trying, the authorities are trying to murder an innocent. Jesus is innocent of any wrongdoing. There's going to be a parade of false witnesses all through the night who, who strangely will be almost completely unable to agree on what their false testimony is. Also, remember this, Jesus is the true king. Not Annas, not Caiaphas. So who really has authority around here? Who's, who's following what authority? Well, anyway, the leaders are nervous. In the Desire of Ages, Ellen White tells us this. This is page 699. Not a few among the priests and rulers had been, listen, convicted. Convicted by Jesus' teaching and only fear of excommunication prevented them from confessing him. That's an interesting piece. Now, Annas knew there were supporters of Jesus, and he knew that the situation was precarious for him. Fear was his weapon of resort. Fear. Have you ever noticed? Many normally upstanding people are quite manipulable through fear. Maybe you noticed it when you looked in the mirror. I think we can all notice it when we look in the mirror. In Luke 22, verse 53, Jesus, when they arrested him in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he call their work? He called their work the, the hour of the power of darkness. Fear. 
fear is one of the powers of darkness. This statement from the book, The Great Controversy, is worthy of our continued reflection. This is Great Controversy, page 591. God never forces the will or the conscience, but Satan's constant resort to gain control of those whom he cannot otherwise seduce is compulsion by cruelty. Through fear or force, he endeavors to rule the conscience and to secure homage to himself. That's what the devil does. So look at the situation. Several even of the Sadducees are under conviction. Not just, it's not just that they were sort of convinced. Convinced and conviction are two different things. These people are convicted. They have a certainty. The Holy Spirit's worked on their conscience. They are sure. They are convicted from the teachings of Jesus that Jesus is the Messiah. Only there's a problem. They are at war with themselves because they are afraid they'll be thrown out, excommunicated. By the way, you know, if you were excommunicated from the, uh, from the temple and all that, you were considered basically to be dead. That was the end. You were basically an outcast. You were like the lepers. You wouldn't even refer to that person again. That person is basically dead to you. That's so there was an enormous power that they had. And that's, that's that naked fear. That's the thing that's preventing many people from supporting Jesus. Annas and Caiaphas are extremely aware of this, and they're extremely concerned about it. Religious compulsion, that's all they have. That's what's holding these people in check. They are afraid. Fear. Fear is always associated with leverage. One thing is weighed against another. A legitimate desire is weighed against an illegitimate one. We have set our affections on one thing and on another thing, and our conscience directs us, telling us, short, showing us that one desire is really more right than the other desire. But life runs in ruts, doesn't it, you know? in tire tracks, in convenience, and in old familiarities. And so we become dead and we become callous toward the sins that we've chosen. And the tug of conscience grows imperceptibly weaker, just a little bit weaker each time we carry on with that darling sin. We just keep doing it, and we don't hear God as clearly or as loudly the next time. So we become deadened, calloused. Callous toward the sins we've chosen. We don't weigh a right God's things versus our human things. And Satan, Satan uses fear in us. It's like a button he presses to work the moral machine toward his goals. Satan's constant resort is to the use of fear or force. Constant. When he rules the conscience, by the way, isn't it true? When somebody rules your conscience, what are, what, are, what are they receiving? They're receiving worship. When God rules your conscience, are you worshiping him? Yes, you're saying yes to everything that Jesus says. When Satan rules your conscience, are you worshiping him? Yes. Revelation 13 those that choose, you know, a candy bar over eternity, they're worshiping not the God of heaven. Satan's constant resort is to the use of fear or force. And so all this coercion that whatever we see in our world, it sort of needs to be revisited because all coercion has the effect of corrupting conscience. When you're forced to do something, even if it was a good thing, it's damaging to your psyche. Fear is constant in totalitarian societies because, like Satan, fear and force are constant, their constant resort also. Be careful about fear. Jesus was fearless. Why? Because he never forgot who he was. And because there was nothing in him that Satan could use as a lever. 
so this questioning continues. Annas questions Jesus. And in the Desire of Ages, we read on page 699 about Annas. Annas thought to draw out from Jesus some statement to prove that he was seeking to establish a secret society with the purpose of setting up a new kingdom. Then the priests could deliver him to the Romans as a disturber of the peace and a creator of insurrection. So that's what he was trying to get. He was trying to pull on a string, trying to find some loose string in Jesus he could pull on. Only there weren't any loose strings in Jesus you could pull on. Jesus didn't give him anything. <laughs> His teaching had been public, yes, often veiled in parable and metaphor, but public. And his questioning was fruitless. It went on and on, and this cruel treatment and beatings and bludgeonings are going to begin to happen now. Look at your Bible at John 18, verse 22. So Jesus tells the high priest, he says, look, if you want to know what I taught, I taught it all over the place. I've taught it all over the, the whole country. I've taught it in the temple. Find some witnesses and ask them what I taught. And when he says that, John 18, 22, says that Jesus' suggestion that Anna Spring witnesses led to the first, the first strike of this whole, I mean, in the Garden of Gethsemane, I guess he probably got some hits too, but one of the officers who stood by, verse 22, struck Jesus with the palm of his hand. And he said, do you answer the high priest that way? Imagine that. Jesus, Jesus, the ultimate high priest, right? The book of Hebrews. He is the ultimate high priest. In comparison, Annas, he is a lost, self-serving pretender. And Jesus just says, well, let's be fair. Why don't you get somebody that I've taught and let's, you get some testimony from them. And Jesus is struck. All through the night, Jesus is going to be physically abused. It's going to increase. But here we see the beginning of it. Now, here's the part that's interesting. In a moment, Jesus' divine power could lay all of his persecutors low. He could blink them out of existence. Oh, yeah, you want to hit me? I'll take that. You don't exist anymore. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus endured. Let me give you about two paragraphs here, again, from Desire of Ages, about that same spot, 700 or so. Christ suffered keenly under abuse and insult at the hands of the beings whom he had created and for whom he was making an infinite sacrifice. He received every indignity, and he suffered in proportion to the perfection of his holiness and his hatred of sin. His trial by men who acted as fiends was to him a perpetual sacrifice. To be surrounded by human beings under the control of Satan was revolting to him. And he knew that in a moment, by the flashing forth of his divine power, he could lay his tormentors in the dust. This made the trial the harder to bear. The Jews were looking for a Messiah to be revealed an outward show. Listen to this second paragraph. They expected him... Jesus, they expected Jesus by one flash of overmastering will to change the current of men's thoughts and to force from them an acknowledgement of his supremacy. Thus they believed he was to secure his own exaltation and gratify their ambitious hopes. Thus when Christ was treated with contempt, there came to him a strong temptation to manifest his divine character. By a word, by a look, he could compel his persecutors to confess that he was Lord above kings and rulers, priests and temple. But it was his difficult task to keep to the position he had chosen as one with humanity. Jesus didn't do it. Jesus kept quiet. And he took the blows one by one all through the night. How widely different what they expected, what Jesus, they expected from him. What the devil wanted, 
these men wanted to see Jesus. You know, they, what they believed, let me read it again, they expected the Messiah when he would come. If Jesus is the Messiah, this is what he's going to do. They expected him by one flash of overmastering will to change the current of men's thoughts and force from them an acknowledgement of his supremacy. What do you think the devils were whispering into the ear of Jesus? Do it. Get him. Don't you think that was what they were saying? Go for it. Jesus stood his ground. How widely different from their expectation. They were thinking of God as a being who with one flash of overmastering will would change men's thoughts. Force. Nothing could be further from the heart and plan of Jesus though. They were thinking of a form of satanic control. Remember, now look at John 19, 23. Jesus' answer to this was what? Goodness. What did Jesus do? He just simply, very gently said, verse 23, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Is that what you would have said? Don't answer. Be inclined to hit back, maybe. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't do that. Desire of Ages 759, two or three sentences here. Rebellion was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His authority rests upon three things, goodness, mercy, and love. And the presentation of these principles is the means to be used. And then the sentence, God's government is moral and truth and love are to be the prevailing power. Kind of like that quote from Great Controversy 591, right? Now, what if it was a matter of force? This would be over. God is, has all power. If this was a matter of force, boom, this would be done. God would have already won. Goodness, mercy, and love are entirely different principles. Immoral governments rely on force. God's government is moral. Truth and love are its baseline. And so, anyway, Annas gained nothing by his examination of Jesus. And finally, he began to be concerned. If you read Ellen White's chapter on it, she says he began to be concerned, you know, about some of the topics Jesus might start bringing up because there was hypocrisy all over the place. So Annas sends Jesus to Caiaphas. And away he's taken. So now I want to look at the second part of our uh, thing today, because now we're going to go with Jesus facing Caiaphas. To see what happens with Caiaphas, we turn especially to Matthew, and I'm going to invite you to turn over to Matthew 26, because there we find an account that tells us quite a bit more about the uh, the interview with Caiaphas. Now Caiaphas, this is verses 57 to 67, Caiaphas is the current high priest of the Sanhedrin. The council's assembled, it's the middle of the night. And so Jesus is dragged to this midnight meeting. This was a hearing of corruption and there's so many reasons we could offer, but I want to stick with one of the clearest facts from the text, and it's at verse 59, Matthew 26, verse 59. This tells us that this meeting was corrupt, corrupt. Listen to it, verse 59. Now the chief priests, the elders, and most of the council, well, it's all the council. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought, they're looking for it, they want it, what are they seeking? false testimony against Jesus to put him to death. You've got a room full, maybe this many people that we have in the, in the sanctuary today, maybe more, I don't know. Got a room full of people, 
all of them are looking for false testimony so that Jesus can be killed. All except Jesus. Now the idea of an orderly hearing, why do you have a hearing like this? Well, it's, it's, it's to protect rights. It's to clarify facts. It's to be sure that judgment is carried out with justice. The rights of the accused, of the accuser, the rights of the community, they're all being upheld. Like when we do a church board meeting or a church business meeting, uh, somebody makes a motion. And depending on the kind of motion it is, you know, 50% plus wins the a vote or two-thirds in some cases. These are all things to protect the rights, often not only the, right, not only the rights of the majority, but many times the rights of the minority. The United States government, the Constitution, is designed with so many checks and balances to protect especially the rights of the minority. That's the American way. Well, Jesus has walked into this room and every single person there wants to kill him. They're united in their purpose. They're seeking not true but false testimony. Now, by definition, if you take someone's life based on false testimony, what are you doing? You are enacting murder. You're, you're participating in an injustice. So this council is not gathered for justice. This council is gathered for injustice. That's what's going on. Nor were there false witnesses lacking. One by one, they came through the hours, one after another. And by the way, they'd been bribed. And yet, all through, as the time went on, not, no two of them hardly seemed to even agree with each other. They brought the charges, and then another one brought another charge, and it was different from the other one, and they could not confirm by testimony what Jesus, Jesus was guilty of that. Finally, a couple of them sounded like they said something similar, almost the same. But if you go over to the Gospel of Mark and look there in Mark 14, it says even those two witnesses didn't agree for all this time going by through the night. Couldn't agree, couldn't agree. Bribed, fake witnesses couldn't agree. Do you, think, do you not think that God was intervening to confuse and confound these false witnesses? The hours dragged on, but Jesus stood quietly as they spewed untruths that didn't, that couldn't match. Have you ever been misrepresented by somebody? Maybe in print, maybe on the internet, maybe in a book that's been published with your name in it, that you teach this and this and this and you don't? You kind of have a, the feeling of, uh, you know, I'd like to straighten everybody out on that. That's a human need, but it's also kind of a need of justice. Jesus didn't do it. Jesus silently waited. He was like the lamb before the shearers. He just was there. The meeting seemed to be futile. Caiaphas grew even more nervous, and he had good reason to be nervous. Page 706, Desire of Ages. His accusers were entangled, confused, and maddened. The trial was making no headway, and Caiaphas was desperate. Imagine that. Imagine having a desperate chairperson of your meeting. Now, he might well be nervous. Let me give you just two or three quick paragraphs. This is from uh, uh, page 703, and this really puts this whole thing into an interesting perspective that I think might be interesting to us. They, this was a pretty edgy thing to do, and once they'd taken the plunge, they were, you know, committed, and this, this, they were on a clock. Things had to go their way soon, or it would be disaster for them. Let me read it to you. They, this is the high priests, they knew the regard in which Jesus was held by the people and feared that if the arrest were noised abroad, a rescue would be attempted. Again, if the trial and execution were not brought about at once, there would be a week's delay because of the celebration of the Passover. This might defeat their plans. In securing the condemnation of Jesus, they depended largely upon the clamor of the mob, 
many of them the rabble of Jerusalem. Should there be a week's delay, the excitement would abate and a reaction would be likely to set in. The better part of the people would be aroused in Christ's favor. Many would come forward with testimony in his vindication, bringing to light the mighty works that he had done. This would excite popular indignation against the Sanhedrin council. Their proceedings would be condemned and Jesus would be set free to receive new homage from the multitudes. The priests and rulers therefore determined that before their purpose could become known, Jesus should be delivered into the hands of the Romans. It's going to all happen in one night or else we're going to lose everything. They are desperate. They feel like their back's against the wall. They can't not do anything about Jesus. And yet, if they don't get this rammed through quickly, they're in deep, deep trouble. So you can see, having taken the plunge, having decided they're going to do this, they must at all costs speed the processing of Jesus and speed him to his murder. Can't wait. It's got to happen. It's got to happen immediately. The clock was against them. And so they feared and trembled, not because of their conscious murderous intent. That should have been the thing they were fearing and trembling about. How could we even be thinking this? They were afraid that they were going to lose the influence with the people. That's what was on their mind. They felt that their control over the people was in great jeopardy, and it was. All these hours of testimony, Caiaphas shifts gears now. He throws aside these efforts, hours of false testimony, and now he asks Jesus the one thing upon which Jesus cannot remain silent, Matthew 26, verse 63. The high priest comes down off his throne and he says, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. That's to the point. All these hours weren't to the point, all wiggling and waggling around to get some fake accusations against Jesus. Boom, he puts it straight to him here. Do you remember what Jesus taught his disciples? John 10, verse 20, uh, rather 32 and 33. John 10, verse 32 and 33. Something important for us in our age, because we're at the end of time, right? I want us to remember John 10, verse 32 and 33, because you, you're going to probably need this one of these days, the way things are going. What did Jesus teach his disciples? You and I also are his disciples. Here's what Jesus said, verse 32, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I, I, Jesus, will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. That's one of the most serious statements Jesus ever made. Now, Jesus was consistent with his own principles, and so here's a fact that he must sustain Although to do it, to utter it, to say it, is certain death. But Jesus has been asked, are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God? And now in a very simple way, Jesus says, it is as you say. That's a yes. It's a clear response. He's not hiding anything. But now he adds more. Verse 64, nevertheless, I say to you, it is as you say, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter, after this, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So here was Jesus standing before a corrupt tribunal. He's an innocent trapped in a room filled with corrupted men. Men seeking to take a life, an innocent life, comrades in crime. Witnesses have been bribed. They were meeting in contravention to their own rules at night. Some members had been left out of the proceedings. Some of the ones that were part of the council weren't there. That was wrong. Everything about this meeting was wrong. This is an abuse of authority, this sham, and this was supposedly would be justice. Yes, Jesus, we, had to, we, we felt so bad we had to put Jesus on the cross, but it was the right thing to do. 
that's what they're trying to provide. And Jesus, in his response, he told their future. Now they would condemn him and use the sword of Rome for his execution, but then, at the future time, he would come in glory, then their roles would be reversed. He would be in authority, they would be arraigned before his tribunal. There would be no bribed witnesses in Jesus in the judgment, no contrived stories. All would appear as in the moment of enactment. All human decisions would be seen in their context, in their self-serving reality. You will see me coming in the clouds. Our roles are going to be totally reversed here. Think about that as you condemn me to murder. Jesus came to give life. These men came to this meeting to remove life. Jesus came to serve others. These men came to serve themselves, to maintain their power such as it is. Jesus came to give goodness undeserved. These men came to hand out punishment undeserved. Jesus came to teach truth. These men came to traffic in lies. Under no circumstances were the priests to tear their clothes. Do you remember when that rule, where that rule comes from? Because remember, the next thing that happens, the high priest, he rips his clothes to make a big point here. But if you go back to Leviticus chapter 10, there's a couple of fellows, you might remember their names, Nadab and Abihu. And they offered profane fire before the Lord. They didn't do things the way they were supposed to. And in those early verses in Leviticus 10, you know, God, Nadab and Abihu were burned to death. And in response to this, Moses warns Aaron and his last two sons, he says, among other things, it was verse 2 or verse 3, right? You are not to rip your clothes. That was a command to the priests. That's where this command comes from. Because why? Because they are priests in service to God and to his people. And because they're set apart to be holy. They are not to rend what God has designed to strengthen his people, to educate his people. All the ways the, you know, the, ways the priests dressed, the mitre, the, 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 all the things, you know. Every piece had an enormous significance. And then for Caiaphas to go up there and do the Hollywood, you know, rip, rip, rip the clothes... Completely wrong. He's in full theatrical here. He rages and rends his garments. He's using God's things to secure the condemnation of God. He's showing by acts that he's fully out of harmony with God's purposes. He has his own purposes. Well, Matthew 26, verses 65 to 68, tell us what happened next. Matthew 26, verses 65 to 68. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you've heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, is this a surprise? He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? They've given themselves wholly over to devils, and now demons are running their minds. That's what's happening. Jesus is in a room with people, but demons are running their minds. If Satan could tear God from his throne and cast him down and maim him, you know he would, but he can't. But here's Jesus. Jesus, he's taken this pierceable, torturable human flesh, and the devils are doing their utmost to exercise cruelty toward Jesus. That's their resort, right? We read that. Nor is this infliction of suffering and pain anywhere near complete. This is just its beginning. It's going to happen through the night. And we may be sure all the time 
the devils are whispering in Jesus' ear, strike out, take your divine power, kill these ungratefuls, execute justice against them, abandon your human example. These pale bags of flesh, they're unworthy of your goodness. Put a crater in this place right now, do it. You know that Jesus was hearing that for the hours. Kill them. Because if Jesus would do that, would the devils go, oh no, they killed our bad guys. No, the devils would laugh and be so happy because Jesus would break the plan of salvation. Jesus takes it. Beating after beating all through the hours. He refuses all these siren appeals. But why? Because we saw already the case was already decided at Gethsemane. But the suffering is no less cruel. And under the cover of darkness and tortures and mocking, it all continues against, against the one being, the one person who never, ever, ever did any other being wrong in all time and eternity. The most innocent person who ever lived is taking all this. Peter says this, 1 Peter 3, 14, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. The physical tortures that we've just looked at are awful, and yet I believe they are nothing compared to the mental and emotional tortures that Jesus also was undergoing. And so this whole event, these hearings, here was a just person on trial, and the whole tribunal was unjust judges, cartoons, men denying their own convictions. The whole event was a lie. It was a suppression of truth. Jesus was the truth, and these men, if they could bury the truth, they would, and they did. They put Jesus in the tomb. But he rose again. And I think that even the more severe torture is what we'll talk about next time when Peter betrayed his Lord because all of our hearts are capable of betraying Jesus. So we want to make sure we can avoid those outcomes it would, because it would break the heart of Jesus. And it wouldn't be too good for us either, but first of all, because it would break the heart of Jesus. Well, to conclude, you can question Jesus all through the night, but he is God. He did live a just life. He never sinned. The Father accepted his sacrifice for you and I, and he will rise again personally innocent and pure. The Father received him back into heaven as part of an extraordinary project to receive you and I there too. Will we accept regeneration? Will we receive forgiveness? Will we consent? Will we desire holiness? Or do we prefer darkness, night, and the absence of light? Remember, they did put Jesus in the tomb. But Jesus rose again. Amen. So we'll take up the story with poor Peter next time.